What is this? In the early 2000s and even the late 90s, there were hundreds of movie tie-in games from the fantastically awful Batman and Robin video game. The Phase 1 MCU games like Thor, Iron Man and the Captain America game that surprisingly from what I heard actually wasn't too bad. But we also got some games that were tied to movies that slapped. Are you sure about that? Like the Lord of the Rings movie tie-in games, which yes, I need to go back to and play those. But when the movie tie-in games slowed down and came to a near stop, we started to get games created using popular IPs such as the Arkham games, the sequel to the first Alien movie in Alien Isolation, which yeah, I guess you can say Aliens is a you know what I mean. And we also got a few attempts in the Lord of the Rings universe like the War in the North video game, but Monolith Productions gave us the best Lord of the Rings video games in the Mordor series, starting off with Shadow of Mordor. It's impossible. Is it? Or is it so possible that your head is spinning like a top? It goes without saying, but if you're a fan of Lord of the Rings, then you already know about this game and its sequel. But if not, what is Shadow of Mordor? Well, imagine the Punisher, whether it's John Berthold, Thomas Jane, or well, the comic book version, but taking place in Middle Earth. A few moments later. That's what Shadow of Moor gives you, and it's a damn good story. Taking place before the events of Lord of the Rings, but after The Hobbit, you play as Talion, a Gondor Ranger who's been stationed with other Rangers at the Black Gates of Mordor. Now, after a straightforward introduction to Talion, his son, and his wife, we get some background into their family and his wife wants to leave the Black Gate, but of course, the Black Gate is attacked by Uruk, and a mysterious group who murder Talion's wife and son before killing him. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. However, Talion can't die for some reason and he is also linked to a wraith who has no memory of who he is. And with this curse, Talion can't be with his family until he finds the person who cast it, the Black Hand of Sauron. Now, from this, Talion goes on a revenge story, and just like John Wick, it's pretty damn satisfying as he takes revenge against the Black Hand of Sauron and his offsiders, the Hammer of Sauron and the Tower, all of which murdered you and your family. And I will deliver you to the Dark Lord, unspoiled. We bow to no one. You shut up! <laughs> I'm so fucking scared right now, you shut up! After a mysterious resurrection and being linked with a wraith, we start to make a name for ourselves in the land of Mordor. We find Gollum, who also helps us find out who this mysterious wraith is, and it is Keller Brimbor, the elven smith who created the Rings of Power. Sounds like a pretty good story, yeah? Well... Yeah, and there are some problems that I will get back to a bit later on, but what about the gameplay? Now, sure, you can have games that have a wicked story, but mediocre gameplay, but thankfully, Shadow of Mordor does not have this problem. Best way to describe the gameplay is by merging the simple and fluid combat mechanics of the Arkham games with the assassinations and parkour of the Assassin's Creed series. Now, Talion has access to three weapons. His main sword, which is used during combat, which is where the Arkham inspiration comes into it. If you've played the Arkham games, then you already know what you're in for, but if not, it's a real simple and fluid combat style where you simply attack with one button, counter with another, and you'll be able to stun, which will then quickly attack and deal damage to enemies, or dodge, which allows you to avoid damage or leap over shielded enemies. The General Combat 2 will have a combo counter, and as you level up and upgrade Talion throughout the game, you'll be able to perform instant executions and stack his combos easier. For example, once you hit 8 hits in a combo by hitting 2 buttons, Talion will immediately execute an Uruk, unless it is a more powerful Uruk, like a Captain or Warchief, and he'll just whack off a heap of their health. <laughs> However, unlike the Arkham games, the combat here isn't a instant win button, and you'll actively need to pay attention to what enemies you're facing off against and what weapons they have. 
Standard Uruks can be taken out with normal attacks and counters. Berserkers deal decent damage against you and need to be stunned before you can deal any damage to them. But thankfully, you can stun an enemy and as you've stunned them, your combo counter goes up pretty quick to perform an execution. Shielded enemies needed to be vaulted over, but the spear throwers and the archers are the ones you need to keep an eye on. Spear throwers can't be stunned from the front and you cannot leap over them. You basically just need to counter and deal damage to them as if they were a normal Uruk. But if you are too far away from them, they will throw spears. Which, unlike the Batman game where you can just throw down a smoke bomb and then go into the predator hunt mode, here in Shadow of Mordor, you'll either need to dodge over other Uruks you're fighting against, depending on what ones you're fighting against, or just basically run to the hills and reapproach the battle from a stealth perspective. Now, Talion also has his son's sword, which has been destroyed in an attempt to fight off the Hand of Sauron, and it's obviously a wicked weapon inspired by Narsil which Talion uses as his dagger for stealth combat. Now, this is where the Assassin's Creed gameplay or the Predator gameplay from the Arkham games come in, where Talion can hide in bushes, he can leap from vantage points from above, or he can simply just sneak up behind an enemy. Now, the executions too are a bit wicked. Now, when Talion needs to be quiet, he'll cover the Uruk's mouth and he'll just stab them. But when it's not overly a problem, he'll put his sword straight through their skull in pretty brutal fashions. Ouch, town population, you bro! On top of that too, Talion can unlock the ability to brutalize his executions, basically stabbing the absolute shit out of an Uruk to spread fear into anyone nearby, causing the weaker and more frightened Uruks to run off in fear. That's right. The final mode of combat is ranged attacks, where Talion will use Celebrimbor's elvish bow and arrows, which allows Talion to move in Celebrimbor's wraith mode, and when using the bow and arrow, it slows down time to let you line up any headshots or charge your shots so you can do more damage, and this can be upgraded to pin targets to the ground with arrows and even teleport yourself to a target's location to instant execute them, which is pretty damn rad. Now, I mainly use the bow and arrow for environmental effects. You see, by shooting fire pits or explosives, obviously sets things on fire. But if you shoot a hornet's nest, it can distract enemies. Or if you shoot nearby hanging meat, it sets it alight, sort of cooking it, and then it summons creatures and wildlife to come in and attack, whether that's the caragors, which are the giant wolf-like cat creatures, or the Graug, which is the Lord of the Rings version of a rancor. Corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. Speaking of Wraith mode, Shadow of Mordor pinches another thing from the Arkham games outside of its combat, and it's the game's version of Detective Vision, which allows Talion to go into a Wraith mode, a little similar to that to say when Frodo or Bilbo wears the One Ring. But anyways, this Wraith mode lets you see enemies, any points of interest like Uruks who can be interrogated or explosives on the ground, and even things like usable plants as well as highlight any captains or war chiefs around you, which is sort of a part of the Nemesis system that I'll get back to. But the Wraith mode system also lets you climb old elvish towers which are used for fast travelling, around the two open worlds that this game gives you in Mordor, and for also changing the time of day, which helps for stealth. But one of the best things about both of these Mordor games is the Nemesis system, where enemies remember you, they're given unique names and voices and characteristics, as well as certain buffs and nerfs, like their weak to Caragors, which are the wild dogs that Oryx can ride, but they can't be stealth killed, or they become enraged when their bodyguard dies. This system is introduced to us when we save an orc called Ratbag and we basically have to keep him alive and promote him up the ranks from Uruk to a war chief in the area. But the overall system is, well, orcs will level up, they'll get promoted and stronger, and the system allow orcs to go from lowly grunts to rank up to war chiefs. Now, when out and playing the game in general while in combat, it's pretty straightforward and super fun, but it is possible to get completely overwhelmed and go into a down but not out state. Now you will get two attempts to sort of save yourself before you finally get killed, but being cursed to live with a wraith you will resurrect, but whoever kills you, whether it's a lowly grunt or a war chief, they'll make a smart ass common and they'll level up, and because Uruks that have killed the grave walker, that's not something to just throw away, and that's how the nemesis system works. Much more chance of promotion for killing a ranger. <laughs> what 
What's happening to me? I am also being promoted to co-manager. We will be co-managers together. Think of it as having the player having a personal connection to an NPC and actually building a rivalry with them. Now, one of the cool things too is when you're first shown the Nemesis system or when you get to this second area of Mordor, which looks beautiful, is that you have no idea who the war chiefs of the area are or who the captains are and if any captains are linked to war chiefs if they act as their bodyguards. But to find out who's who in the zoo, you can interrogate green highlighted Uruk when you're in Wraith mode who will reveal members in Sauron's army for that area. Now, they will not only reveal who is who, but they'll also reveal strengths and weaknesses, which is very important. If I know me, he won't like being kicked in the crotch. Now, you can find captains out and about in the world by going into Wraith mode and clicking over a red highlighted enemy. Now, this will tell you that this is a captain in Sauron's army, but it won't tell you their strengths or weaknesses, which, as I mentioned, makes up all the difference. For example, in the second area of Mordor, I needed to control all war chiefs in the game, and you're given an ability where Celebrimbor can basically mind control Uruk to fight for him. Stand up. Not you. Sit. No, not you. You sit. You stand. No, sit. So, you need to interrogate or find an Uruk captain and basically find out which captain worked as a bodyguard, or that's what I did, then I would mind control the war chief's bodyguard, which was a captain, when searching out in the open world, so I could sort of bend their mind and they worked for me. Then, from there, make the relevant war chief appear out of hiding, command my Uruk, who was the war chief's bodyguard, to betray him, and then help my Uruk kill the war chief, so then he would be promoted to the new war chief. Makes sense. Now, this portion of the game is a bit repetitive, but every encounter was unique, and each captain is a different enemy variant that needs to be tackled differently. For 99% of the captains, I basically would just whittle down their health, stun them, and then sort of took control of their mind. But that's the beauty of the Nemesis system. It all works and makes some great gameplay challenges and some fun interactions. Each Uruk, whether it's a captain or a war chief, has a strength, weakness, name, and personality, and they all sound like the orcs and Uruks from the movies, or the orcs from Warhammer 40k. If you've been taken out by a lonely little warrior, that warrior will get promoted and get a name and a personality and have a rival with that Uruk and each captain and war chief gets random buffs and perks. I keep repeating myself here. And it keeps Shadow of Mordor always refreshing, interesting and unique where each player will have a different experience. Now, there are some things with Shadow of Mordor and also its sequel that might have some massive Lord of the Rings fans scratching their heads. For starters, the game is basically fan fiction and it breaks a bit of canon. Now, I'm not a massive Lord of the Rings fan, but I enjoyed the movies. And yes, that includes the Hobbit movies too. The extendeds were much better than theatrical. That still only counts as one! But, from what I've heard from some of my mates who are massive Lord of the Rings fans, yet this doesn't happen in the Tolkien universe. But something that I did notice that this game has is Gollum is in the game and he's designed straight from the films, but the world does have a bit of the Weta Workshop styling and inspiration around it too, which I really enjoyed, but I couldn't help but notice the very obvious, but Sauron's armour isn't the one he wears in the film, so the game is sort of half pulled from the movies but also half creative allowing the developers to create their own spin, which is cool, I won't want to lie, but when I first saw it, it kind of broke my brain a little bit. Now, being a 10-year-old game too, it's not overly long, with only 20 main campaign missions, which you can just fire through, and yeah, that's sort of what I did. Now, there are side missions, and there is a fair amount of story DLC where you can play as other characters and such to extend your playtime with the game. So there is more to do here besides the core story. But I found myself single-minded with Talion's story for revenge and I just wanted to rush forward with it. Now, there are two separate areas of Mordor to explore, one being very traditional to what you've seen in the films with the rocky, desolate terrain, yet the second area of the game is very green and lush, which is actually kind of cool and something we obviously didn't see in the films with Mordor. The areas that are in Mordor, though, in this game, aren't overly large in scale. But there were moments where you need to go from one side of the map to the other side of the map, and the elvish towers that you sort of can climb in the wraith mode 
work as fast travel points or to advance time if you prefer to say play at night time but this will also update Sauron's army in the Nemesis system making some people stronger or even killing them if they have feuds. For example, if you want to go from day to night, obviously time has to elapse to do that and as you go forward in time, that might actually cause two Uruks to get into a fight with each other, your mind controlled Uruk might die and you might be back to square one. Graphically, Shadow of Mordor though is still gorgeous and sure there are some muddled textures here and there but the rain effects and Talion's ripped cloak and the wind is damn beautiful and mixing in the environments with the strongholds of the game with the day-night cycle is pretty damn great. There are moments where you feel like Batman or an assassin or you feel powerful as Talion the Grave Walker when you're stealthing around a stronghold in the middle of the night while it's raining. It's pretty badass, I won't lie. But would I recommend Shadow of Mordor? Well, if you are a Lord of the Rings fan or you want to play something genuinely fun, then yes, without a doubt, Shadow of Mordor is a polished game that's still graphically beautiful, the story is engaging and being a merge of looking like the films, but the developers having some fun with the designs and creativity of its characters, and it's something we've not seen in video games being tied to an existing well-loved property. So, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, you enjoyed the Batman games, or you just want a damn good time with a video game that you can simply pick up, enjoy yourself, and then move on with, then yeah, check out Shadow of Mordor. But whether you've been a massive Lord of the Rings fan because you read the books as a kid, or you only have seen the movies and you enjoyed the movies, or whatever it is you like about Lord of the Rings, always remember, you can play with each other and play with yourself.